Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. There's no more empowering celebration of the First Amendment than the museum in Washington, D.C. I recall traveling to the original Roslyn site and on several visits over the last decade being most inspired by the journalistic achievement archived, exhibited, and explained there. Today we welcome the museum's leader for a discussion on the future of free speech. Jeffrey Herbst is president and CEO of the museum and the Museum Institute. From 2010 to 2015, he was president of Colgate University. And in a recent Wall Street Journal op-ed column, Herbst shares a sentiment we've expressed on numerous occasions here on The Open Mind. He writes, Google, Facebook, and other tech companies say they aren't news organizations. But that claim is becoming increasingly implausible. Herbst continues, as these companies enter further into the news arena, they will have to develop an understanding of where their editorial role fits into American and world society. Certainly a fundamental challenge will be to delineate how their for-profit imperative and shareholder demands interact with their role as providers of information. Truer words have not been spoken. Jeffrey, thank you for joining me here today. Thank you. Those seem irreconcilable to me at the moment, the for-profit imperative and the necessity to develop some kind of utility online, that is news. How can they cooperate? Well, we're in a new era and it's going to take time. But I should note that newspapers in the 20th century face the same problem. They're for-profit entities and they also wanted to serve the public good by reporting information. And the owners of the Washington Post and the New York Times and other newspapers last century agonized a great deal about how to align their profit interests and the public interest and came to some philosophical solutions. They weren't perfect. Perhaps they weren't always um, uh, adopted uh, at the precise moment of conflict, but they were significant approaches which were intentional. I think Facebook, Apple, Google are going to go go through the same agonizing process. They are for-profit companies. There's nothing wrong with that. They're transparent about that. But a significant proportion of the American public is now getting their news via these social media platforms, and even more people are going to be informed that way in the future. So they're going to have to think through uh, this issue. I think the current binary approach, either their tech companies or their media companies, is not the right one. Uh, they're media companies, but they're 21st century media companies. They're not the newspapers of the 20th century. And they're going to have to think through what their public role is. The public, their consumers, will also demand that. How do you get Facebook to acknowledge? It was just the other day, Sheryl Sandberg, once again, reaffirming, we are not a media company. How do, they, how do we get them to the place where they accept that responsibility? Facebook, I think, is they have suddenly become the means by which an extraordinary number of people are getting the news. And this has happened far quicker than anyone, I think, including Facebook, has imagined. Um, they are getting pushed into this area. Uh, just recently, there was the controversy over the so-called Napalm Girl photo, where Facebook took down the post of a Norwegian newspaper which included the iconic photo from the Vietnam War of a young girl running naked from a napalm attack. Uh, that was taken, had been taken down 
by Facebook in the past. It was taken down again as part of their community standards. When the paper and then the Norwegian prime minister objected, Facebook stood by its deletion of the post and then they reversed course. And they themselves have admitted that their community standards and this work is a work in progress. At the same time, Facebook, Twitter, and others are very active in uh, scrutinizing posts that may be related to promoting terrorism from terrorist organizations that are taking those down. So they're, n they're more than just the pipes. They're obviously exercising some degree of editorial control. They just haven't conceptualized themselves as something other than a tech company yet. I think they're going to be forced to because the number of these incidents will continue and I think they will get under ever more scrutiny as more and more people get their news uh, from these uh, media platforms, especially via mobile technology. At least in the case of Facebook, they, they don't seem to be acknowledging that the absence of editorial, in fact human discretion, is causing injury to the company. They did take their human curators off the trending topics. It wasn't off of the news feed and are trying to do it algorithmically. That's proven to be difficult. They're posting some fake news right now. Uh, I think, you know, I see both sides of this. This is happening at an extraordinary speed. Three years ago, people weren't talking about this issue. And the amount of news they're transmitting to ever more people has increased at an extraordinary rate. So they've only been in this business, if you like, a short period of time. And we're asking, and I'm advocating, that they do something which the Post and the Times took, frankly, decades to work out. And it was still a work in progress then. At the same time, just given uh, the more than one billion users that they have, and the many more billions that are going to join in the next few years, they are rightfully under a lot of scrutiny. So I don't minimize the problem. Uh, I know they're aware of it. Uh, I just think that the current place they're in, which is this binary choice technology company, media company, is in the wrong, that's the wrong place to be in. They have to conceptualize themselves as a new type of media company for the 21st century. That's going to take time, but I think they need to go down that road. Brian Stelter of CNN, Reliable Sources, media critic, did a terrific essay recently on the peril of fake news and imploring his viewers to double, triple check sources. It does seem to me that programmed into the flesh of Facebook and Twitter are these erroneous stories. And to what extent do we want to champion someone's right. We don't want to champion their right to engage in that kind of, it's not even journalistic malpractice as the New York Times Magazine reported this year. These kinds of anti-Clinton and anti-Trump propaganda have fed into Facebook's monetization machine. We're at the first steps <laughs> of the democratization of information. You know, we ju at the museum we just celebrated the centennial of Walter, Walter Cronkite's birth. And you know, he had an impact on the American public that was extraordinary. For 20 years he said that's the way it was, and the next day people would talk around the proverbial water cooler, that's the way it was. There'll probably never be a journalist who will have the gatekeeping function like Walter Cronkite did. And in the past there were a few newspapers and three television networks that filtered the news to people. They provided relatively accurate, high quality journalism, but from a not very diverse source of people and from only a few companies. Now, of course, anyone can post, blog, tweet. 17-year-olds um, have 10 million followers on YouTube. In that democratization of the news, which we view as the free exp free, right of free expression realized, there's going to be a lot of great stuff and a, and a big junk pile. And I think we're only at the start of figuring out not only how can our companies work to flag what is high quality journalism, but we're going to have to recognize the responsibility of people uh, to become intelligent consumers of the news. In the past, if you listened to Walter Cronkite and read the New York Times, you are probably a pretty well-informed person. Today, 
there are far more sources available. There's a lot more information coming at you. Uh, but you're going to have to think hard about how you're going to be a consumer of the news. It's no longer going to be a passive activity. And that's the road I think we have to start down. What are the qualities of Cronkite that can go mainstream again? Well, first, I mean, there were just very few lanes through which information passed. And so that's... You that's know, out of the picture. No, I picture. understand. But, but I think he had developed a credibility. Part of it was a personal style, obviously. Part of it was, however, signaling and telling the American public at critical moments uh, that he had an independent perspective which he would, which he had the responsibility to convey to them. Uh, in our Reporting Vietnam exhibition, uh, we have uh, some segments from Cronkite who played a critical role in the coverage of Vietnam and, of course, eventually came out against the war. And Lyndon Johnson said, if I've lost Walter Cronkite, I've lost the American public. But the American public trusted Cronkite enough, uh, his bona fides, his judgment, his style, of course, uh, to follow his lead, as it were. We're probably never going to have someone like that again, not because some of our journalists aren't as good. We have outstanding journalists. There are just too many lanes and uh, too much competition. Well, talk about how those lanes manifest themselves on a college campus and the plight of free speech, because that water cooler conversation is something that has turned into a, a great controversy in terms of uh, stigma associated with speech and certain kinds of speech. We've discussed this on the program uh, with Caitlin Flanagan, who's written extensively about college students can't take a joke. Um, this question of microaggressions, safe spaces. Where do you come out on, you know, sort of how the water cooler conversations should be playing out on college campuses today? I'm worried as a former college president and an advocate of free expression and free speech. It's complicated. I should say that residential colleges and universities are among the very few institutions in our society right now that are actually trying to create intentionally diverse communities of people who live together. In many ways, society is becoming more segregated, especially by income. And the universities and colleges, residential universities and colleges, are trying to do something very difficult. That said, uh, the American public perceives colleges and universities as among the places least receptive to free speech which is not only bad because these institutions are based on a vibrant and courageous discussion of the issues, but it's bad for their standing in society. We've done a survey of college student attitudes towards the First Amendment with the Knight Foundation, and we found it's complicated. Students are overwhelmingly in favor of political speech. The controversies around graduation speakers, other invited speakers, I think obscure the fact that overwhelmingly students, to an even higher degree than adults in the American public, want to be exposed to a variety of political opinions. And administrators should take heart that there's a strong constituency for a free political speech on their campuses. However, students seem to differentiate between political speech and conversations, discussions about particular groups on campus or about individuals. So close to a majority of students on campuses that we surveyed, about 36 four-year colleges and universities, believe, for instance, that the press should be restricted from covering student protests if the protesters so desire. And those sentiments are even stronger among women and African Americans. So there are some significant free speech issues. Finally, I think you can't underestimate the degree to which social media has just transformed the college environment and college discussions. Students, more than anyone else, live on their phones, live via mobile. and. Uh, that's great. They're getting a lot of information. They have access to more information at their fingertips than anyone in world history. And it's also proven to be problematic in ways we can discuss. Flesh that out for us a bit. You're saying that these young people, specifically African-American communities within the college space, don't want 
their protests to be recorded or well, covered? They, about 42 to 46 percent of uh, college students say it's legitimate to restrict the press from covering, college pro from covering protests on college campuses if that's what the protesters want because they think the, the media will be biased. Students tend to have a dim view of the media in general uh, or because they think that the protesters' message won't get out. There's an even higher percentage of women and African Americans who believe that. Um, I think what's happening on college campuses is complicated. I mean, but you, but you think that the, the that stance is inspired by this notion that their protests are somehow going to be marginalized by the mainstream press or, well, or I misread. I think I think a couple of things. First, for this generation of young people who have grown up digitally. Free expression and, f and a free press can be separated. In the past, when you had a protest, you wanted the media to cover it because that was the only way to get your message out. Today, you don't need the press to get your message out. You can put it on YouTube, you can tweet, you can blog about it, and it can go out far faster than the college newspaper will publish. So students uh, separate free expression and, and free press in a way that we've never seen before in American society because of technology. And second, um, they're willing, they want, in many cases, and as I said, this is only close to a majority. It's not overwhelming, but it's close. Um, they think that the protesters should have the right to tell their own story without the mediation of the press, and that's something different. Well, this, this curmudgeon millennial would say that that is extremely problematic. Right, because the norms of civil disobedience and justified anger in the form of a protest, a sit-in, that if you want those to carry legitimate weight with you, President Herbst, or the local press, whatever constituency you're attempting to rally, you, you want that you may want to upset the status quo, but you have to adhere to a certain set of, of values in implementing your agenda. How do you, how do you see that disconnect? Uh, and that's very interesting. And uh, there's just been a report by Penn on uh, free speech on college campuses, which investigated this. The ch change from the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement intentionally used all five freedoms of the First Amendment. Uh, speech, press, religion, petition, and assembly uh, to promote its views that all Americans should enjoy equal civil rights. The change we've seen in this generation of students is the belief that they can promote their agenda without recourse uh, to some of these rights, and indeed that the rights underst as understood by society in general are somehow marginalizing them. I think that's wrong. I think the people who feel disempowered, who feel marginalized, should have the greatest interest in a vibrant First Amendment because the powerful don't need rights. They, they will get done what they want done. It's the people who are marginalized, who are disempowered, uh, who's, for whom recourse to rights is most important. But you're right, that disconnect is occurring on college campuses. It's fed by a variety of reasons, but not least that social media uh, with its ability to go around traditional press has been the venue by which so many students communicate, protest, and live their lives. I can understand how social media can be the first line of defense against an injustice. We've seen that play out in domestic disputes and police disputes around the country. But this idea that you're going to be insulated from um, the values that ought to influence protest, you know, that you, you're not going to face the same degree of scrutiny. I, I just don't understand that, 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 you know, what are you trying to hide if, you know, your goal is a public outcry? I don't think, I think they're not trying to hide. I, did, I agree yeah. that with your dismay. They're trying to shape their narrative by themselves that there is a significant mistrust for So this is like the worse. ultimate PR it's the mindset. Ultimate, right. It's the view that you can talk directly to the public 
uh, without the press. Uh, and as I said, in a world where 17-year-olds have 10 million followers on YouTube, you can understand that. Yeah, and, and I think also there's a, a deterrent to the extent that the tactics are unsavory or uncivil or ill-advised in the implementation of a protest, which has also been documented just as much as injustice has been conveyed through the Snapchat, the Vine, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. etc. So, you know, what, what I think this is leading us towards is those water coolers being so segregated in terms of what the reality is on the ground. How do you teach at the museum and in your former career as a college president, teach values that are going to desegregate these, these disparate water coolers around the, the confines of a college campus? I think it's a, it's a good question and you know, it goes beyond college campuses because absent intentional effort, many of these social media platforms will feed you the same views, the same information that you've indicated in the past that you like. So the possibility of ever narrower conversations is a real one. I think first you have to ask college students, and we certainly did this at Colgate, what are you trying to do on social media? What are you, what's your intention here? Um, what are you trying to learn? Um, I think we want to go beyond telling students and others, wow, these are cool tools, to ask them a deeper intellectual question. What are you trying to accomplish? And I think they need to provide the answers. Second, I think we want to begin to have a discussion in this country about civility and etiquette on the internet. I think uh, that anonymous speech is too powerful. Now, anonymous speech, as I said, is protected speech. There's no question of that. But just because you have the right to say something doesn't mean you have the right to be listened to. And I think far too many students, but also many other people, spend too much time paying attention to anonymous speech, anonymous comments, when without attribution, you don't know the authority of the person, where they're coming from. So I think we have to say to students, look, do you really want to pay attention? Uh, do you really want to base your actions on what someone who you don't know is talking about? One of the great moments I thought at Colgate was when the faculty briefly took over the social media platform Yik Yak and made comments like, wow, uh, your exams are next week. I hope you're studying and taking good care of yourself or it's going to be cold tomorrow, uh, dress appropriately. And the faculty, as educators, not only made those posts, but put their names on it. And I think that was an important teaching moment, uh, which should have implications elsewhere. I think we have to get beyond the gee whiz factor of social media, because we're still in the early days of this revolution, to say, each person is going to have to say, what am I trying to accomplish here? And what do my contributions mean from the, for the community? As you see the plethora of students uh, emerge from their classrooms into the museum, what strikes you most? The students are hungry to discuss these issues. Surprisingly, what we also found in our survey is that the students believe there's actually too much anonymous speech on the Internet. Uh, they also believe that uh, much of the discussion on social media is not civil. I think one of the things that's gone wrong in our society is that older adults have abandoned or not tried to join social media. That's too difficult. That's for the kids. That's for the millennials. Um, what we're hearing from the students is they may live on their phones, but they're not happy with a lot of what they see, what, what they experience. And I think the educators on campus and those of us uh, in society have to join a conversation that these technologies are the future. There's no going back. Uh, but we can shape them in important ways to make for a better society. And what we see at the museum is students who want to learn about how people in the past have exercised their rights and how they can do so to make for a better society. While this generation is often, young generation is often criticized for um, uh, too much sensitivity and the like, they're also very concerned about social justice in our society and around the world. And I think we can join those to say, look, you can shape these tools. We can all shape these tools together to make for a better society. But we're going to have to uh, do it consciously. What are some examples of that kind of consciousness 
um, that can be modeled among journalists today to right the wrong that these young people are seeing on their right. devices. I think that journalists are going to have to meet their consumers, which will, now that the millennial generation is the largest generation in our society, they're going to have to meet them where the young people are, which is on their devices. And that we're still in the early days of figuring out how news, long-form journalism or the like, is going to segue into the type of platforms that people are using while they stare at their devices. Uh, that's going to take a lot more thinking. I think journalists are going to have to, and this will be part of the post-mortem of this election, figure out how to highlight important news, significant news, that goes beyond yelling or the coarse finger, finger pointing of one side or another that may gain a lot of hits and may gain a lot of viewership in the short term, but which is not informing our society. I think clearly journalists in this election were also adjusting to the social media election. I think we're going to have to look back at this election and say, look, what was news? How was it transmitted? How was it transmitted well? The problem, of course, is the gold co posts keep moving. I mean, the technology keeps changing, uh, and we're going to be at this for a long time. But if we can become more intentional journalists, and most of all, I think, intentional consumers, we have the opportunity to take tremendous advantage of these great technologies. I think you said it about intentionality. Unfortunately, the gold posts, Jeff, are the profit motive, but I yearn for, and myself on college campuses, call for a more deliberative media approach. We think about de deliberative democracy. We ought to be thinking about deliberative media in making the assessment that you describe and not be averse to this idea of activism or activist journalism. Deliberative democracy requires deliberative journalism and deliberative journalists. Thank you, Jeff, for being here with me today. Thank you so much. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash open mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation. With special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.